Okay, um, I'm decided to do something a little bit different today, um, something a bit more creative. So I thought well, I'll go back to my old favourite, using a bit of Scratch. Scratch is a very simple uh, block-based visual coding method um, introduced and, and made freely available by MIT. It's something that's very much underrated. I mean, it, it is Turing complete. You know, it is capable of doing quite a, a range of uh, applications. But people think, well, it's block-based, therefore, you know, it's 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 not visually... Um, oh, I don't know what happened there. Uh, it's not visually uh, the best um, program to, to use as such. It's not, it's not comprehensive, I should say, just because it is block-based. But actually... Uh, it is very comprehensive, I think, if you want it to be. Uh, and I thought, well, I'll, I'll touch upon something that, that took my interest a couple of years ago, um, working on a, a maths conjecture, the Colax conjecture. So I thought I'll do a little presentation, uh, an introduction to what the Colax conjecture is. I'll do it over a few episodes, and I'll code um, and sort of read out my thoughts as I'm as I'm coding up some of the... Uh, not, not. I'm not going to solve the Colax conjecture, but I'm going to code around um, some solutions to problems in order to visualise and, and understand and frame the Colax conjecture uh, a little better. Okay, so um, a few posh words in there. Um, we've covered what Scratch is. Um, sc sorry, I just cupped my hands there and made a, a slight... Uh, 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 yeah, anyway... Um, so, uh, I'll try not to do that again. Right, Scratch is a um, programming language, okay? It's, it's a block-based programming language. The Colax conjecture, well, I thought I'd introduce this term conjecture before anything else. Um, so some, some of the other words for a conjecture, a, a conclusion, a supposition, opinion, theory. Essentially, um, a conjecture is something that's proposed... Um, it's been observed, so a pattern, and then a theory has been developed based around that pattern or observation. So that could be a list of numbers, etc. There are mathematics, the world of mathematics is full of conjectures, um, and um, there's quite a few out there um, that are unsolved and um, substantial financial rewards for solving them. Um, and the Colax conjecture is just one of such theories. So it was a, an observation made by this gentleman, Lothar Colatz. Um, in 1937, he introduced this idea that basically, if you take any positive number, okay, so on the number line, any number that sits to the right hand side of zero, okay, you take any positive number and you apply a condition here. If the number's even, you divide it by two. Or, if the number is odd, you multiply it by three and add one. Okay, You keep repeating that process until eventually the process, well, either terminates or, or loops round. What, what we do know is that actually this process gets repeated and eventually ends up in a loop. Um, if, it, if it repeats, and you apply this process to any positive number, okay, uh, eventually that number will reach the number one. Sounds a bit incredible, but we'll, we'll go through a few examples. Now, technically, what actually happens is this process causes the number to land in a loop, which goes four, two, one, and then back to four, and then two, one. And we'll have a look at that in a second. Um, any conjecture, well, typically a conjecture is quite easy can be quite easy to disprove because all you have to do is if you've got a theory that says this works in this way you know this is my proposal that this will always work you only have to find one example where it doesn't work and that's disproven that conjecture so in a way it's quite easy to disprove a conjecture just by finding one example but we haven't yet found an example and we've done a massive search on a range of numbers. Um, I'm guessing around about 2 to the power 60, 2 to the power 80, something like that. A massive range of numbers. Um, this conjecture is a fine example of something that's very, very hard to prove. What I like about the Colax conjecture, which is why I decided to, to program with this, is it's actually 
quite easy to grasp and understand what it's about. It's just extraordinarily hard. So don't fall for it being something that can be worked upon because some of the greatest mathematicians have um you know have confessed to working upon this and and not succeeded the latest progress was by a mathematician um terence tau who um who's an incredible mind um and he 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 sort of i think in his own words he, he sort of came close to proving it without actually proving it really um Okay, let's um, have a look at an example of this collapse conjecture. So remember, we take any positive number. If it's even, we divide it by 2. Or if it's odd, we multiply it by 3 and add 1. Okay, so take the number 5. Right, that's an odd number. So we're going to multiply that by 3 to get 15. Add 1 to get 16. It's an even number, so we divide it by 2 to get 8. Divide by 2 to get 4. Divide by 2 to get 1. And divide by 2 to get Sorry, divide, I missed that there. Divide by 2 to get 2, divide by 2 to get 1. Um, 1's an odd number, so what you would do then is times by 3 and add 1 to end up back at 4. And then you can see the, how that loop there, so it sort of terminates in a loop, this sequence. The next one, 8, that's an even simpler one. We just divide it by 2 because we end up with even numbers all the way down to 1, and then re-enter that loop. And I've picked the number 9 here. It's a bit of a longer sequence, but we can see that 9 is odd so 9 times 3 is 27 add 1 is 28 we then have an even number so divide by 2 divide by 2 again to end up with an odd number this time 3 times 7 21 add 1 22 divide by 2 to get 11 we end up with an odd number so we get 33 34 divide by 2 to get 17 and it keeps repeating this pattern all the way down to the loop 4 2 1 you can see we started off with a number 9 and we ended up getting up to the number 28 here, which is greater than the number 9. Even the number 14, once we divided by 2, was greater than number 9. So there's this idea that these numbers go up and down. Um, now, this, this is quite interesting, this, this, this pattern of numbers. We call this a sequence of numbers. So this sequence goes up and down. And it gives rise to the name of these numbers. They're called hailstone numbers, in, informally, colloquially. Um, they're called hailstone numbers because of the way hailstones form. I'm not a meteorolo meteorologist. I can barely say the name, so that proves I'm not. But, um, hailstones, when they form in clouds, they sort of gain weight and 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 uh, lower altitude and then lose weight and they just go up and down up and down before eventually they come into a hail shower that's probably a terrible explanation but but that's why they're called hailstone numbers because they just seem to these sequence of numbers go up and down before eventually they fall down to four two one as a loop um i thought it'd be great to illustrate this in scratch uh, let's have a look so this if you've never come across Scratch before. This is the graphical user interface, the GUI for Scratch, the, the interface for the software. It's on a website, so it's a piece of web software. So if I click on this link here, then nothing happens. Something will happen, I'm sure. Ah, it's opened it up in a, another monitor, has it? No. Okay, let's just try one more time. There we go. Okay, so it opens up Scratch, and um, I don't think you need to log in. I mean, I'm logged in, but you, you probably don't need to log in. We'll see. You click on Create, and there you go. You've got this interface. When I said it was this visual coding style, it's because without having to type on your keyboard, you can program things just by dragging blocks. Um, and there are different sections on the left here. Um, and I'll talk you through it as we begin to write our collapse conjecture um no, i shouldn't say solver but visualizer should i say okay so it is legitimate coding for sure um just because it's drag and drop blocks and not literally typing on a keyboard it's uh it's very much a programming language okay um the question is why are we going to do this then i suppose um well you know hopefully one day someone out there may solve the collapse conjecture but by solving it that that could either be proving it disproving it by finding a very very large number that doesn't satisfy the conjecture or proving that it can't be solved as well would be a, 
in a way, a solution. Um, I'll not go into the details of that I was about to, but I won't go into. So all of that for QDOS, really. Um, but because it's very simple to understand, it's nice introduction into sort of working with the maths conjecture and the world of maths conjectures. And if this is interesting, then hopefully you'll go out and find out about more maths conjectures out there. Um, twin prime conjecture, for example, uh, they all get very, very complicated. Um, but there are some other very simple to understand maths conjectures out there as well. Um, we're going to understand the basics of programming using this visual block editor. And, and I'm sort of going to read my thoughts aloud on how to build up a program and just take it step by step as well. Um, and then, you know, potentially there's one million pound prize run up for grabs as well uh, if we solve this conjecture. Okay, so without further ado, let's jump into Scratch. Now I'm going to use the offline editor of Scratch. It's something you can download and install at least on a Windows PC. I imagine you can install it on Linux and Macs and things like that. If not, there's always the web browser to make use of. So this is Scratch. Um, quite simply, when you go into open it up, it starts up with a new um, scheme of work, if you like. Uh, you can go to File and New. Now, Scratch is um, lovely because you get this backdrop, which is called the stage, okay? And you can put some scripts, some coding onto the stage, get it to do stuff. And this is a sprite. Maybe I'm assuming you've had some experience with Scratch before, because I don't want to sort of get too bogged down in basics. Apologies, I'm just pouring a coffee now. Um, but at the same time, I'll, I'll sort of go through the basics and, and it'll serve as a reminder or, or something new anyway. Um, a sprite is, is like a, is a graphical entity that you can do something with. Um, on the screen. Very early computer games used sprites a lot, you know, 2D platformers and things like that. Um, this sprite happens to be a cat that's loaded up, but we're not going to use this sprite, so I'm going to delete it for the time being. Mm, that's great coffee. Okay, so um, to start off with, we want our program to do something. Um, and in order to do something, we need it to respond to an event. And the event that we typically use is clicking this green flag button. Okay, so you click that and get it to do something. So I'm going to go to the events section here and say, when the green flag is clicked, I want you to do something. Okay, now let's have a think about this as well. There is a, a, a school of thought of planning this out in a flow diagram, etc., and listing out all the variables. And I would totally agree with that as a, as a formula for, for coding. Um, it's just that this program is quite small and it would be nice to sort of organically develop it and then hopefully come into some issues. That's what I'm anticipating. Um, things not quite working and, and investigating why they're not quite working. Right, so we are going to be working with data. Okay, we're going to be working with units of information. We're going to be storing numbers and things like that. So we're going to need something out of the data tab. Okay, now to store data in a computer program, you need a variable. Okay, so we're going to make a variable. I'm going to click on that button. Now, what, what am I going to store? Well, I'm going to store this number, aren't I? I'm going to probably have a starting number for my Colat sequence of numbers because that's what I want to visualize. All right? I want to visualize these Hellstone numbers. So let's just call that starting number. Okay. And click OK. Okay, so it's created a variable there called starting number that I could assign a starting number to. So hmm, my next thing then is really. How am I going to assign a starting number to that? Well, let's just put a random number in it when our program works. So I'm going to use this block here, and I'm just going to drag that in there. So notice that I'm working on the stage. That means that these variables are going to be available to the rest of the program as well. I deleted that sprite, if you remember, and I clicked on that stage. And I'm in this scripts tab here. So when the green flag is clicked, set the starting number to zero. Well, we said we're going to set it to a random number. So let's have a look. I think the random 
numbers are in this operators tab here. That tends to be more maths operators. And we're going to pick a random number from 1 to 10. Great. So let's, let's try this program out. This is now a, a functioning program, I hope. So I click the green flag and I get a number 8. Superb. So that appears to be working as intended. OK, let's. Uh, I, I, I am juggling about on multiple screens, so you'll have to forgive me. Um, but let's just have a quick look at this. OK, I won't be a second. OK, this appears to be working. So let's click that green flag again. We seem to be getting the number eight a couple of times. OK, that was just luck, thankfully. Uh, and there we go. So it does seem to be working quite well. Now, just trying to catch up. I do apologise, just making sure that it's streaming correctly. Appears to be. There we go, the joys of live streaming. OK, that's good news. Right, so one more click for look and we get the number three. So we've got our random number being assigned in there. Now, what we do, just to revisit that slide there on the colat sequence, if the number is even, we're going to divide it by two. Or if the number is odd, we're going to multiply it by three and add one. So let's go back to our program and attempt that. We're going to use something called selection. Now, selection is a conditional route for a program. A program has a linear path that goes from A to B, unless you have selection in there. So it decides, oh, it will do this if this condition is met. So we're going to go into this control tab and we're going to use this block here, the if something, do something, else do something else. So what we're doing is we're testing whether or not the number is an even number. And the mathematical operators we need to use is this mod operator here. OK, mod. So what we're going to do is we're going to say if our starting number here is even. So what we need to do is say starting number mod 2. And then we're going to use another operator here, the equals, equals zero. So if you're not too sure about this mod function, what it does is it says, get that number, divide it by two, and see what the remainder is. Now, if it's an even number, any number divided by two will have a remainder of zero. And if it's an odd number, it will have a remainder of one. OK, so this test, this condition is basically saying, is it an even number? OK, if the starting number mod 2 is 0, i.e. if the number is even, then we're going to do something. What do we do if it's even? We're going to divide that number. So let's do that. And then we will say, if we go into this data tab, we need to set the starting number. So to be the result of the starting number, divided by 2. And let's drop that into there. So again, if the number's even, then set that number called starting number to be itself divided by 2. Or else, if it's odd, what we're going to do, we're going to times it by 3 and add 1. So we're going to need the multiplication operator and the addition operator as well. So we're going to add 1. So I'll put a 1 in there. Now we're not doing the add 1 first, we're doing the times by 3 first. So I nest the multiplication into the addition operator there. Okay, looks like I've got a space in there. I'll just remove that. Oh, I've got a few spaces in there. Okay, so if it was odd, we're going to multiply that starting number. You can see I'm nicely dropping those blocks into those spaces, and they do fit as well. 
I mean, that's the nice thing about Scratch. You can see that's a, a rounded block, fits into the rounded hole. Um, so we're going to set that starting number to be itself, multiply by 3, and then add 1. OK, let's have a look at if our program logic works there, because this bit is the logic, really. So we're going to click our green flag. It will set a starting number to be a number from 1 to 10, and then do a test on it. And we'll see how it goes. OK, now here's the difficulty is I've lost track of that starting number. I could probably work backwards and think, well, if it's 28, it must have done the times 3 add 1. So our starting number must have been 9. But I wasn't, I'm not too sure. So maybe I need some different way now of tracking what my starting number was and what my subsequent sequence was. And I won't be just tracking one number. I mean, this looking at these sequences here, they could go on quite long. And actually, I don't know how long they can go on for. Well, fortunately, Scratch has a fantastic tool for that. It's called a list. OK, if you're familiar with another programming language, um, then usually the term array is used. But a list, we'll, we'll call it a list for simplicity. And that's exactly what Scratch does. So I'm going to click on make a list. And what's this list going to contain? It's going to contain my sequence of numbers. So the nice thing about using a list is that I don't have to create a variable for every possible number that's going to be in my sequence, because I don't know how long my sequence could be. What happens if it's 50,000 numbers long? That's a lot of clicking on make a variable 50,000 times. But with a list, the nice thing is it can just store a list of words or numbers. And in this case, we're going to use numbers. Now, what I need to do is take my starting number and add it to a list and then add another number to the list and keep doing this and keep doing this and adding it to the list. So in a way, I could change the starting number itself. Let's have a look at that. So um, pick a starting number, a random number from 1 to 10. Now I want to add that starting number to the list before I change it. So nicely i've got this add thing to sequence okay well i'm not going to add the word thing to sequence let's see what happens when i click the flag okay it's generated a random number as i've told it to and um, this block of code because it's not connected to the event it's not executed so it's a, it's a temporary way of just removing that block of code and then i've added the word thing to this list called sequence if i click the green flag again I've got a starting number of two and I've added the word thing to the list. Starting number of three, starting number of ten. So it's doing exactly what I've told it to. Although this list is now getting bigger. And actually, every time I'd click that flag, I'd probably want that list to clear. So let's do that, actually. Let's clear that list. And the way we can clear that list at the beginning, before we start doing anything, there should be a clear list here. Delete. OK, instead of just deleting one item, I'm going to delete all the items. So let's do that right at the beginning before we do anything else. Let's try it now. So I did the word thing. Try it again. So I did the word thing. OK, well, it's no use in adding the word thing. What we want to do is add the starting number so we can make use of this. Remember, a variable is a bit like a container. It contains the number. The name of that container is starting number, or the name of the variable is starting number. So I'm just going to put that in there and then click that green flag. Well, let's have a quick think. What do we expect to happen? We expect it to clear the list. We expect it to pick a starting number, a random number from 1 to 10. And then we expect it to add that starting number to the sequence. So let's do that. OK, so it picked a starting number of 6 and added 6 to the list. Let's do it again. Nine. That bit's working so far, so good. Let's bring in our logic now. Okay, so we are then we've added that starting number to the list, and now we're going to say, you know, do the test. Is it even? Then divide by two. Or if it's odd, times it by three and add one. Let's just click the green flag and see what happens. Okay, so we've got. A starting number of 22. Well, that's now a bit of a misnomer, really, because 
it's it, although it's labeled starting number, it's not actually representing the number we started with. In the list is the number we started with because we cleared the list. We chose a starting number between. Now I, I might just change that. I don't know what happened there. Let me just stop and just redo another example. Okay, so um, we started with a certain number between one to ten. We added that number to the list, so we must have started with five. We added it to the list, and then we've done our chest test, and then we've changed that starting number. Um, we could really do with adding that new number to the list and redoing this. So let, let's do that now. So let's add that same starting number to the list. And we should now, well, let's just run it. So we had a starting number of eight, and then we did this operation on eight, this function, and we ended up with a four and then added the four to the list. And we could keep doing this now. Let's just duplicate that. So all I did was right click on the code blocks I wanted. I only wanted it up to this logic bit, this if condition. So if I drop that in there, we'll do another test on it and then add it to the list. Now, the Colax theory is that all numbers end up as 1. So for this particular sequence, I would have to keep doing this until I anticipate you get into 1. But I don't know my original starting number. I mean, this time I click on it, it started with 5 again, and then it went to... Oh, sorry, we started with 6. Then we divided it by 2 because it was even. Then we times it by 3 and add 1 and got 10. And then we divided by 2 to get 5. I'd have to keep constantly duplicating these code blocks and when we're doing something over and over again either exactly the same or similar it starts to suggest we need something called a loop which is a form of repetition or iteration is another word and if we go into this control we've got these selections of loops here we've got a loop here where we can repeat something a set amount of times we can even go forever or we can do a sort of loop that's conditional. We can keep repeating until something, a condition's met, until something happens. Okay, well, let's think. Well, we don't want to go on forever because we, there's no point in our program going on forever. I mean, that would just, we could do that. We could, we could have a quick look and see what would happen. All right, so we pick a starting number. We add that starting number to the list. And then forever, what we're going to do is we're going to keep testing that starting number, doing an operation on it, and then we'll add the result to the list as well. So let's do that. Wow, the program really is running forever. If I get this list here of all those numbers that are added and look right back at the beginning, the first number we picked was a 3, then we went to a 10, and then we went to a 5, 16, 8, 4, 2, 1. And then we keep repeating that 4, 2, 1. So I suppose we've seen evidence of this collapse conjecture now because it's just repeating 4, 2, 1, 4, 2, 1. But there's no point in going on forever. We want to wait until something happens. We want to repeat it until something happens. Well, we're only interested, really, once the number gets down to... Well, we know if it gets down to 4, it's always going to go 2, 1 because the rules are there. But let's pick 1 anyway. Let's keep repeating it until a number gets down to the number one. So we're going to reuse this repeat until function here. OK, so let's get rid of that forever loop and put in place this repeat until something. We'll just get rid of these. I'm just going to left click and drag them off the script stage here into the bin. OK, in fact, I'm going to get rid of this block of code here because we don't need all this duplicate code. This is the main stuff, isn't it? The test and then adding the number to the list. So we can put that in there in a second. Let's just think about this condition. We're going to repeat until the starting number gets to be the number one. OK, or starting number equals one. So let's go into the operators and we find this equals comparator here. That's quite nice. And the shape fits again. So if we drop that in there, we're saying once the starting number equals one. So if I drag starting number there and then I put a number one in there, we're going to keep repeating whatever blocks of code are in the middle until this condition is met. Starting number is one. Let's drag this code block in there and then tick that green flag. Oh, so we started with a number 10. 
it halved it, tripled it and added one, and then we just halved it because all the subsequent numbers were even. Looks like it's working. Let's, let's just do another test. Wow, this list is 20 big. So I wonder what our starting number was. The number nine. Okay, so the number nine, it went up to, all the way up to 28. In fact, that's probably not the highest it's gone up to. It's gone up to 52 there. You can really see why they call them hailstone numbers because it's gone up and down. And one of the reasons why we're doing this is we're going to try and see if there's a pattern to this. Okay, but it's gone all the way up and down, up and down, adding the numbers and ended up as the number one. So the logic seems to be working. Let's just do another random number. Oh, the number four we started with. Okay, that's a very simple sequence. I suppose the number one would be the simplest sequence. Um, we could change our random numbers to be any number from one to 60. Let's do that and hopefully get a few higher numbers. Okay, this sequence is 17 steps long and it started with the number seven. I don't think we're getting higher numbers. Okay, this is 25 steps long because it says at the bottom here the list is 25. Okay, well that's technically including the original starting number. So we started with the number 49, that went all the way up to 148. Goes down. So our logic seems to be good. Not really happy that the variable's called starting number and then that seems to change that starting number. That's not really true. It's, it's sort of the next step in the sequence that changes. So I might create another variable called step. And, and the other thing is, it, I could. it's hard to find out what our starting number is because we sort of lose track of that. If we keep changing the contents of this variable, we'd have to really go back to the start of the list to find out what our starting number is. We might find it useful later to actually keep the variable called starting number as a starting number. So let's rename that variable called step. Okay. There we go. Um, I'm going to call it sequence step. Somewhere later on, I might use the word step for something else or need to use it in something else. So it's better to just be as specific as possible. So I'm going to call that sequence step. Um, Nothing should have changed because I just renamed the variable. So the program works the same way. The nice thing is renaming it here, renamed it all along the program as well. But remember, I've still not solved my issue because I, I'm still losing track of that original starting number in sequence step. So let's create a variable called starting number again. So start number, click OK. And let's Instead, this time, we're going to set the start number to be a random number from 1 to 60. And then we'll also set the sequence step to be whatever that start number is. OK, so now we've got two variables and a list. So let's tick the green flag. So the start number was 10. It's remembered that because it hasn't changed the contents of start number now. Click the green flag again. Start number was 50. And it's just the sequence step that's changing all the time. OK. And if we're quick enough, we might be able to see that running through and changing. So our start number was 58. And after 20 steps, it took us to number one. I don't really need to see that now. It's not that useful because that's only quite temporary. It just stores a number before putting it into the list. So let's hide that variable. I can right click on it here and hide it. I can just untick it here to hide it. So I'm just going to untick it. So really all that's useful now is seeing that start number and then just seeing that sequence of steps. Start number seven and the sequence of steps that takes us to one. Well, so far in running this program, we haven't found an example that doesn't end up as one. So it's looking like that conjecture from this very limited. We haven't found a, a number that's proven this conjecture to be false so far. And um, we've only looked at to number 60 though, uh, admittedly. Well, wow. now that's really gone on. Our start number was 31. And this time we went through a sequence of 107 steps to finally reach the number one. And it's gone through some big numbers. What would be nice is instead of manually scrolling down to find out what's the largest number it gets up to, 
because that number 31 gets all the way up to 1336 even possibly higher um ooh, it has gone higher it'd be nice to write a little bit of code to find out what that maximum number is and we'll come back to that in a second then we'll we'll, we'll do that in a bit um Something that I'd like to do now is visualise these numbers, okay? Because it's all fair and well looking at a chart of numbers, and we can make use of this. We can right click and go to export and export this. And it comes out as a text document, and you can use that in other software like spreadsheet software and things like that to make use of this. But I'd like to see something happening. In order to visually see something happening, we're going to make use of a sprite several options when you're making a sprite in scratch you can either choose an existing sprite from a library you know so there's lots of little clip arty style things um you can upload your sprites even take a photo of yourself from from with a built-in camera etc we're just going to draw a sprite i'm going to draw a very simple sprite we're going to draw a circle okay so i'm going to click on the circle here um, I'm not going to do it red, I'm going to make it blue. I like the colour blue, so let's just make it a dark blue. Um, we only need a small circle, I'm just clicked a whole circle, so I'll draw that here. There we go, a small dot. Try and uh, align it in the centre. Okay, so we've got a very tiny sprite. In fact, it has appeared on our screen there. Okay. Um, I just it's so tiny oh I've got it there okay so you can interact with that sprite and things like that but I'm going to get that sprite to draw out the sequence of numbers now the nice thing with sprites or costume it's called costume one I'm just going to call it blue dot it's more meaningful even though it's not essential it's not going to change your program it's I find it really useful when you remember to try and name things appropriately so when your program gets massive and you're dealing with lots of sprites you can remember oh that's the blue dot costume in fact the sprite is called sprite one and this is one of different types of costumes I could have another costume called red dot so I could duplicate that instead of blue dot two I call it red dot and if I wanted to use my program to have red dots, I could make a red dot. In fact, it's just easier to use the paint bucket tool and try and fill it as red. Didn't properly fill it, so let me just draw a red dot. There we go. Okay, so that's a costume. A sprite would wear different costumes, um, and you can get it to do different things, but actually, um, the sprite itself, if I rename that, now let's go, hmm, let's double click it. Can I rename it if I double click it? Nope. There is a way to rename that. I just can't remember how to rename that at the moment. Um, hopefully I'll remember and then I can come back to renaming that in a little bit. Maybe it's in the info. Oh, there it is. Okay. So what we're going to call this dot. Okay. That'll do. Okay, so Dot has two costumes, a blue dot costume and a red dot costume. Now, we're going to get our dot to go to a place represented by this number. This stage, this backdrop, and it might be easier if I just maximise it, this backdrop has coordinates, like a grid, like a map. There's X and Y coordinates. Now, they're not shown, actually, when I maximise the window, but if I go down here and move my pointer here, you can see these X and Y coordinates moving. So let's go to the bottom left. The bottom left appears to be X minus 240, Y minus 180. The top right appears to be X 240, Y 180. So it looks like the coordinates go all the way from minus 240 on the left to plus 240 on the right and minus 180 to plus 180 at the top. OK, well, maybe we can use that with these numbers, although some of these numbers are massive. So they'll be a bit bigger than our grid can cope with. So let's go back down to the scripts and let's change that random number to pick it. So one to ten. So it's not going to be too big for our grid initially. Um, what we want to do is move that dot. So if we if we generate a sequence now, 
we'd want the first part in the sequence to be the number five. So we'd want to move the dot roughly five high. And then the next stage in the sequence will be the number 16. So the next dot will be 16 high, and then eight high, then four high, then two, and then one. So we'd have to be changing our X coordinates and our Y coordinates all the time in order to do that. So let's go into the scripts for the dot. As you can see, when I click on dot, there's a blank area because we've got no scripts for the dot. If I go back to stage, we've got all the scripts we created to actually run the, the colat sequence and the logic, etc. So let's go back to the dot here. Now I need this dot to do something. I need it uh, an event. I need it to be triggered. Um, it's not going to be when I click the green flag, because when I click the green flag, we're going to run the colats sequence. So it could be when I hit space, etc. There are options, but actually what I prefer to do is use these messages. Um, the nice thing about Scratch is the next thing we can do when we finish running that sequence and we've built up our list, so tick the green flag, we can broadcast a message. I'm going to use the broadcast and wait option because I want it to send a message and then wait for that program to finish running. OK, um, what I'm going to send is the message draw sequence. Click OK. All right, so it's going to run this, populate the list with a load of numbers, fill the list with a load, load of numbers, and then it's going to broadcast this message draw sequence in the sprite. It's going to listen for that message. And when it gets the message draw sequence, it's going to do something. We're going to use the motion now and it's going to move to a certain point. And the best one we're going to use is this go to go to coordinates. So when I receive the message draw sequence, I'm going to go to the coordinate. Now, remember, we went to minus 240. So let's go X is minus 220. And y is minus 160. OK, so let's click the green flag and see what happens. Oh, it did. It ran. It populated the list. It broadcast that message. The dot received that message and then it moved to those coordinates. Great. But remember, we want these coordinates to reflect what's in our list. So how can we do that? I wonder. Well, if we treat minus 220 and minus 160's bottom left, the next thing, all we need to do really, is move the dot up, say, five spaces. OK, so let's do that then. So we need to find out what's in the list, first of all. And the way we can do that is go into this data and we can say, get item one of the sequence, OK? So the list called sequence, I should say. And item one would be number five in this instance, OK? So instead of going to x is minus 120 and y is minus 160, let's just drop that in there and see what it does. OK, so it went to minus 220 and then it went to the first part of the sequence, which was there, eight. Now, if I duplicate this, I bet you it's going to go too fast for us to see what's happening. There isn't an item. Oh, maybe I can overtype this. Let's go item two of the sequence. Item three of the sequence and let's do that. OK, so it did rapidly go very fast. And again, we can't do this because we don't know how long this list called sequence is going to be. We're going to have to keep duplicating these boxes. So we're probably going to need one of these repeat loops again. We're probably not going to use the forever and we don't know how long the list is, so we can't repeat it a set number of times. So we're going to have to use this conditional repeat again. So repeat until something happens. OK, um, if we're going to repeat until something happens, well, what's the something that's going to happen? We're going to keep repeating it until we get to the end of the list, aren't we? So we're going to have to need to know how long that list is going to be. So let's go into the data. And there is a handy thing down here called length of sequence. Great. So we're going to repeat until the length of the sequence, until we get to the length of the sequence. Well, we need some way of tracking that. 
So let's create a variable and let's call it position in list. Um, there's an option here. Do I want this available for all sprites or just for this sprite? Well, I'm probably not going to use this in my main program. It's just to really position this sprite. So I'm just going to say for this sprite only. Tick that and click OK. Great. So I, I can see the variables I created on the stage in there, the two there, sequence, step and start number. But now when I'm in the sprite, I can see the additional variable called position in list as well. Hmm. What I'm going to do is when I receive this draw sequence, well, I'm always going to start with the first position in the list. So I think the first thing I'll do is I'll set position in list to be number one. OK, it's a nice way of what we call initializing variables, but it's a nice way of resetting variables. So every time the program reruns again, we're not storing old values in there. And if we got to the end of this list, 20, and then we ended up starting with the number 20, the next time we run this, it could be a bit confusing if we don't set it back to number one. So position in the list starts as one. Now, remember, we're going to repeat something until that variable called position in list equals the length of the list. So let's do that equals. That's a key word in there. So equals repeat something till something equals something. And the equals something is the position in the list equals the length of the sequence. OK, so hopefully We'll keep repeating this and repeating this. So if the list is five times long, it will just run five times. If it's 200 times long, it will run 200 times. Um, every time we run it, though, we'd want the position in the list to change again. OK, so we, we want it to start off as number one. And then we, next time we run it, we want it to be number two. So we're going to have to change that position in the list by one every time. We're going to have to increase it by one. So we know we're going to want that in the loop at some point. What are we doing? Every time we look at a number in this list, we want the y coordinate, the height of this dot, to reflect that number in the list. So again, we're going to probably make use of this box here. Now this picks out either the first, last or random item in the list, but we want a specific item in the list. The first time we run this loop, position in the list is number one. So we, we, this will work. We'll pick out item number one in the list and we can set that as the Y coordinate. In fact, let's just use those boxes there. Oh, that's the same box. OK, so we can set that as the Y coordinate. So this dot will go to X is minus 20 and then our Y coordinate will be whatever item in the list we're currently looking at. So the first run, it will be item number one. The second run will be item number two. So what's nice is we can use this position in the list variable here. So the dot will move. So on the first pass, it will move to position X is minus 220. Y, well, what's position one of sequence? Nine, Y will equal nine. We'll then increase position in the list by one. So position in the list now equals two. OK, does two equal the length of the list? Well, in this example, it doesn't because the list is 20. So we'll run this code here again. We're going to go to minus 220. Now, that's not useful because all it will do is put dots on top of each other. I anticipate because the X coordinate will never move, but the Y coordinate will move. Let's see what happens. Let's just run that. It very quickly flickered. Let's just have a look again. But we didn't really see the flickering so fast. We could do with sort of stamping it is exactly what we're looking for. Let's make a stamp. OK, what that does is it imprints the, spy, the sprite onto the backdrop. So if we go to, I think there's a stamp somewhere here, pen. There we go. We've got stamp. So what we'll do is we'll stamp it every time it changes that Y coordinate position. Let's just click the flag. There we go. See all those dots there. Let's do it one more time. 
Ah, the trouble is now it's retaining those dots. We need to clear it as well. Ah, the nice thing is we've got a clear block here. In fact, what we could do is clear all the pen marks whenever we run the program, not just for this sprite, but everything. So I'm going to put this clear box, this clear bit of code, under when I tick the green flag. So let's run this again. So it cleared it and then it restamped it. One more time. Oh, well, we started with the number one there. Nothing exciting there. OK, so it seems to be stamping it, but not quite a graph. I'd like that dot to move right one every time it it follows another step in the sequence. So we need this x vari this x position to change. So we're going to have to use an x variable, a variable to hold our x coordinate. So let's make a new variable. Literally just call that x coordinate. OK, again, it's only really for this sprite. So we'll just click OK there. Um, we we want to always get into the habit of clearing our variable. So I'm going to set that to be zero to start off with. Now, we're going to go to position. Well, we're going to start with minus 220. So why not set that x coordinate to be minus 220? OK, and then when we first start it, we can start there. We can go to the, to minus 220. We set x coordinate to minus 220. When we start the program, it will do that. But we want it to increase it every step. So every time this runs, we want to change that x coordinate and add 5 to it. So let's do that. Let's change x coordinate by, yeah, well, let's add 5 to it. And click the green stamp. OK, so we went 4, 2, 1. Not too exciting there. Bit strange, I can only see two dots, though. That's interesting. Let's try it again. This time I can only see three dots, but it has moved. It has moved from, it's gone 4, 2, 1, not 8, 4, 2. Or it might have gone 8, 4, 2 and not carried out the 1. Either way, I'm only getting three dots and not four dots. So there's something here. The position of the list equals the length of the list. So it runs it when the position was 1. Okay, It runs all this code because it did the test as 1 equal 4? No, it doesn't. Does 2 equal 4? No, it doesn't. Does 3 equal 4? No, it doesn't. Does 4 equal 4? Yes, it does. And we're repeating until that's true, until 4 equals 4. So we've got a bit of a problem here. Actually, what we need to do is say when it's greater than the length of the list. So that's great. That's our first sort of hiccup. Well, it might not be the first hiccup, but there we go. Now, it'd be nice to see that rerun for the value of starting value of eight, but when well, we might get that, let's just run it. Starting value of five, the list is six long and we've got six dots. Great. Um, so it seems to be, oh, we've got one dot for one and we've got the three dots when we start at four. That's great. Um, but this is ever so tiny. Um, we could do with some way of scaling this now. So why don't we do that? Why don't we scale it so it's not just a height of y given by this this is this y times something. So why don't we do three? Okay, make it a little bit bigger. Let's do whatever that entry is there. We're just going to times it by three just to get more space on the screen. Okay. Oh, that's a nicer pattern already. Um, We'll go back into here. Instead of just picking random numbers from 1 to 10, we'll, ex we'll increase that range a little bit. We'll do up to 1 to 100. OK, tick the green flag and see what that looks like. Oh, we've got a nice pattern. Let's maximise this screen. Do the green flag again. Wow, this list is long, isn't it? Wow, look at all that. All along the top there, all along the right there. Oh, that's not great, is it? So what was our starting number? 54. Evidently, 3 times um, 27, 82, is really too high. 82 times 3 is, is bigger than the, the maximum y height of this. So all of, a lot of these numbers have exceeded that. The number 41 is presumably that one there. And then again, it exceeds it. So got a bit of difficulty. We really need to scale this, but not by set number a bit more dynamically. Hmm. Where are we? Um, 
Why didn't I put my scale in there? Times by three. No, that's my, sorry, I'm on the wrong thing. There we go. So we did a times by three. Let's let's think about how we can scale this a little bit more dynamically. Um, well, the maximum height is 180 and the minimum height is minus 180. So we've got a lot to play with. In fact, one of the first things we can do is we can bring everything down because Y is zero is around about there. So we can always minus 180. Let's minus 160 off whatever we've got for the Y coordinate. So we'll do that, minus 160. Let's see if that makes any difference. Okay, great. So it started at the bottom left. That's a big sequence. Ah, oh, well, that's made a huge difference. Okay, sorry, I'm slurping my coffee. Um, however, on this example, where it looks like we've started with the number 41, it's gone up to some massive numbers. I'm sure I saw some thousands in there. Did I see a 5,000? Yeah, almost 5,000. So even though we've done the minus 180 to, to adjust the axis, so we brought that dot further down by 180, still not good enough really. We need to rescale it definitely dynamically, so depending on the size of it. Um, so let's have a think about this. Whatever the maximum number is, we always want it to be at the maximum height, which is 160. Okay, so say if the maximum number, say if it came up to um, 320. Okay, sorry, the maximum height is really 320 because if it's minus 160 to plus 160, it's, it's going up to 320. So say if our number was 640, we want to scale that down by two, don't we, to bring that to 320. And then when we minus the 160, we end, it up, we end up with it uh, 160. So whatever number it is, um, mm. sorry, last slip of coffee. Whatever number it is, we want to scale it down. So the way we can do that is we can always divide that number. The highest, yeah, let's do that. The highest number of this list we want at the top. Okay, so that will be the, the, the 160 y coordinate 160. So I suppose the first thing we need to do is, is write a bit of a program to find out what the highest number of the list is. Great, well, we're gonna go back to the stage then to work with that. Clicking on the stage there. Um, we're gonna do this before we start drawing things. So we've gotta sort of find the maximum height before we draw things. So. What we're going to do is we'll do a block of code here and we'll use another one of these broadcast blocks and we'll put this broadcast block. So if I go here, broadcast, um, we'll put it before we draw things. So we'll do it in there. And I'm just going to call this um, find max height. There we go. Ooh. Max underscore height. Click OK. So this is going to find the maximum value in the list. OK. So as we go through the list, well, let's do a, a when I receive, when I receive max height, when I receive find max height. So we're going to have to look through the list and we're going to have to find out what the maximum value is. Um, and the best way to do that is to create another variable, yet another one. And this time we'll call it We'll call it max height. OK, it's available to all sprites by default because it's created in the stage. Click OK. Um, let's start. When the program started, it's ticks and this is message is broadcast. We'll set that maximum height to be zero. OK, so it, so it starts off at zero. And what we'll do is we'll test each item in the list to see if it's bigger. And if it's bigger, than zero, then we'll add that to be the maximum height. And we'll go through the whole list doing this. So we'll test the first item, and this is a good example. Is 41 bigger than zero? Yes, it is. So we'll set the maximum height to be 41. We'll look at the next item in the list. Is 124 
bigger than the current maximum height, which is 41? Yes, it is. So we'll set 124 to be the maximum height. Look at the next item. Is 62 bigger than the max height? Well, in this case, it wouldn't be. So we wouldn't change anything. And we'll keep doing this, going through all the lists, until we get to the end of the list. So great, there's a few clues in there. We're going to need to use a loop, and it will be another repeat until, until we get to the end of the list loop. And we're going to use selection again. So we're going to do an if statement. So if something happens, then we're going to change something, etc. So we'll, we'll use this if block again. Um, the if statement's going to be in the repeat because we're going to test each thing. So let's put the repeat here. Now, repeat until we get to the end of the list. So in order to track if we're getting to the end of the list, we really need another variable to track our position in the list. Now, we've got one here, position in the list, but that's for something separate. That's for drawing, etc. OK, that's not available to the main program either. What we need to do is create another variable called position in the list that's available. I'm going to call this one list position. OK, so it's a little bit backwards. Uh, click OK. And that will track our list position. Remember, we need to set that as zero so we don't have any confusion from the previous time the program's run. So we've set the list position to zero. Actually, in Scratch, lists start off at number one. So we're going to set it to number one. Now, looking back at this bit of code here, this was our test to reach the end of the list. If position in the list is greater than the length of the list called sequence, so let's duplicate that and let's drag that into the stage. OK, and then I can get rid of this duplicate box. If I go back into the stage, there's that bit I dragged in. OK, um, it's not called position in the list, though, this time it's called list position. There we go. So we've got our test, all right? We're going to repeat an action. And remember that action is comparing is each number greater than what we previously recorded the maximum number to be, all right? So we've got our if then here. So if the number is greater, well, to find that position, that number in the list we're looking at, we need item something of the list, list position. So item one of the list, then item two of the list, item three, etc. If that's greater, so we need that operator greater, greater or less than. So, and then we need max height as well. Let's have a look. We'll run, it, we'll run through this then. So remember this little bit of code here, this we'd call it a subroutine if you like this little subroutine what that's doing is saying when I've received this shout to run find the maximum height okay I'm going to set the maximum height to be zero and then I'm going to set the position in the list to be one now I'm going to keep repeating this block of code until that list position becomes greater than the length of the list i.e until we reach the end of the list and the block of code is thus if the current item in the list we're looking at is greater than the max height, then what we're going to do is we're going to set the maximum height, set max height to be that item in the list. Brilliant. So if we run that code now, Let's see what happens. We've got a max height variable being shown there. Is there any variables we can hide that we're not interested in? Well, let's have a look at them all anyway for the moment. So we've run that code. It's a long list, 112. The max height was 27. Oh, that's strange because that's not the maximum height. I'm surprised at that. But also look at this code. This is all highlighted in yellow. And this is, if I click the stop button, it's no longer highlighted in yellow. It's because it was executing. It was running that code. Let's just click the green flag and see it one more time. Still highlighted in yellow. And that max height is set as eight. This is strange. Let's have a look at this logic. Repeat until list position is greater than length of the list. And the list position is one. 
Okay, one isn't greater than the length of the list, so it will do that code, but it stays as one. What we've got is a little issue here where we need to change that list position to then be number two, then number three. We need to add one to it. Okay, so let's change list position by one every time. Let's run that code now, see if that makes a difference. So each time, each time it runs through this loop, it's changing list position to be the next one. So it will look at number two, etc. And it's found a maximum height of 64 in that list. Mm, seems to be working. Let's run it one more time. OK, that list is 25 long. It reckons it's found a maximum height of 88. So just one more time, what it's done is it looked at list position one. OK, and it said, is list position one greater than the maximum height, which remember was set at zero to begin with? Yes, 50 is. So it's stored, set the maximum height to be that particular number there, 50. And then it changed list position to number two and it repeated this loop. Is two greater than the length of the list, which is 25? No, it's not. So let's run this code. Is the next one greater than 50? No, it's not. So it didn't run this block of code. It didn't change the maximum height. The maximum height stayed at 50. It only changed it when it hit 76. And then it only changed it when it hit 88, because 88 is greater than 76. And then none of the subsequent numbers would have been larger than 88. So that seems to be working. We found a way now to find the maximum height of the list and store it in a variable called maximum height. Because that's working, I'm not so interested in the list position variable. OK, but I will keep that maximum height one on the screen because that looks to be useful. If I go back to the dot code now, remember we were doing all this to, to scale our, our graph, our illustration of that sequence of numbers. In case we've got some absurdly large numbers, we still wanted it all to fit on the screen. Because if I tick the box without changing our sprite code, wow, that's a long list. I wonder what the starting number was. OK, so 108 and the starting number was 62. Remember, all these dots appear at the top because our screen's not big enough, so we were scaling it. Now, we want our maximum number to basically be the, at the very top of this list. Are there any other variables I can just hide that I'm not too bothered about? I'm not too bothered about the position in the list. I think the X coordinate's working, but I probably would need to do some scaling with that. But I'm just going to get rid of that for the moment. This maximum height is useful to do. So imagine the maximum height was, say, 320, 320. Um, I would then need to have some way of reducing that down to, well, all right, 320 is a bad number. Say if it's 640, I would need some way, some scale factor introduced. And one of the easiest ways to do that is create a scale factor. Um, we're probably going to need a scale factor depending on the, for the y-axis, depending on the height of these numbers reached. So in this case, you know, 9,000 is quite a big scale factor to reduce 9,000 to just be 360, I think it was, 320 maybe. Um, so we need a y-scale factor. So let's just call that y-scale. OK. Now, again, we've got 320 pixels to play with. So if, if the number here was 640, we'd have to scale it by half. We'd have to divide it by two. So that Y scale factor would end up as 0 0.5 or half, basically. So let's just do that mathematically. Let's put an operator in. Or in fact, let's set, set the Y scale to be the maximum height of these numbers divided by however much we've got to play with, which will be, um, I keep forgetting, 320. So set so Y scale to be the maximum height, max height, divided by 320. Great, and we can drop that in at the bottom, at the top here. So when we first run in the 
program we're sort of initializing the x coordinate to be minus 220 the position in this to be one and we're setting a y scale okay so if the maximum height was 320 we do know y scaling because 320 divided by 320 is one if the maximum height is 640 we'd end up with a y scale of 0 0.5 now instead of doing that times by three which we did earlier we can do it by times by the y scale let's try that Let's run that code again. OK. So, ooh, the Y scale this time was 0 0.2. That's quite a small Y scale. And the reason being is I've actually got this the wrong way around. Looking at that, just instantly, I can see that I've done... Imagine if the max height was 640. And I need to reduce 640 down to 320. Well, 640 divided by 320 is 2. So it's actually doubling the height. It's making the problem worse. I actually need to do it the other way around, which is 320 divided by the maximum height. So I'd get a half. Let's try that one more time. Nice big list to play with there. Seems to be doing what we want it to do. Bit of trial and error. You can see that Y scale variable there. So we've ended up with a maximum height of 232. So if we said, what is 232, um, sorry, the other way around, what is 320 divided by the, the maximum height 232, we end up with a Y scale that's sort of amplifying it this time. It's times in it by 1.3. Let's try one with a maximum height that's greater, hopefully. Starting number 72, the maximum height was itself so it, so it never went bigger than its, its own starting position, actually, which I presume is blocked by these variables here. So if I could put those along the bottom or something. Do we need the list box now? I suppose it'd be handy to just keep that. So we have our starting number, we have the maximum height, and then we have the Y scale as well. Let's run it again. Great, so we can see we had a starting number of 81, which looks to be this one up here. And the maximum height got to was 244. So I'm lying then. This one was the starting number 81. It went all the way up to 244. And then it went back down to, well, we know from the list, it went back down to 122, which is about halfway up. Yeah, so it appears to be working. Let's just do a few more examples. Yeah. Definitely seems to be working. Well, wow, that's a long list. OK, it's great that we've picked that example because, again, we've gone off screen. So we could do with some way of um, scaling the X coordinate. That would depend on the length of the list so we can fit the list onto the screen. But we've got a difficulty here. Um, we've got from minus 220 all the way to plus 220 pixels. So 440 pixels to play with. Um, I haven't seen a list in the numbers we're picking that's longer than 440, but even if it was, we're going to have a bit of difficulty because we can only really have the resolution of a pixel anyway. So we, it's not like we can move on half a pixel. So I'm tempted to leave that X coordinate as it is and not really worry too much about scaling it, but instead of changing it by five, maybe I'll just change it by two every time. The other thing is, mm, it, the X coordinate represents the steps in the sequence as well. So if a sequence was just five steps long, it would still fill the screen. And actually, it's nice to get a feeling of how long a sequence is by how much of the screen it fills as well. So if we were always scaling it, it doesn't matter how long the sequence is, it would always fill the screen. So it could be better just doing it this way without scaling it. Let's have a look. Starting number 53. Sequence ends fairly quickly, but does reach quite a big height. The height is 160. Starting number of 65 gets all the way up to 196, but ends fairly quickly, only 28 steps. Technically 27, because it puts the first number on the list. 18 steps there. Starting number of 36. Great, so we've got... 
a nice work in program that illustrates our collat sequence. So just a quick recap then, and this, this is a nice um, illustration to have a look at really. What our program does is it takes a random positive number between 0 and 100 and it applies the collats function to it so that if it's even it divides it by 2 and if it's odd it times it by 3 and adds 1 to it and then repeats and repeats and repeats until the sequence gets down to the number 1. Look at this pattern here. I don't know if you can discern something here but but basic lines etc. It would be and this is the whole point of our of visualizing this this mathematical conjecture is to see can we spot any patterns that's that's an aspect of computational thinking really is is can we spot patterns um i think some of the questions i would still have outstanding with this is well has it been useful that that's one of them really you know and, and i think it has i think it's it's got us to be able to visualize and appreciate what this collats conjecture is all about um and did we learn something well i hopefully well i did uh, and i'm hoping you did as well if that's something new in scratch and using scratch then fantastic um or if that's just a refresher on how things work in scratch that's brilliant as well the nice thing about this video i'll, I'll save it to youtube is you can pause it and rewind and follow along and build your own sequence and also what i'll do is i'll put the code onto mit scratch so you can have a look at the code from there as well um so can we see any patterns really um is 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 really a big question um and yes we can but the other question is are the patterns significant or are they just trivial you know can, and i suppose something's trivial when you can explain quite readily why those patterns are there well without seeing the numbers associated to the dots i mean we've got the numbers in the list it's, it makes it difficult. It, maybe if the numbers were tagged along each dot, we could say, oh, yeah, that's that's obviously the reason why we've got a pattern. But certainly we seem to be having patterns emerging. Uh, that looks a bit random. But as we get to those longer lists, like this one, this one's a list length of 113. There's, there does seem to be patterns emerging. Um and, you know, I'll not give any spoilers, actually. It'd be interesting if you want to find out why those patterns emerge and, and have a play about with it and come up with some theories. Um, I suppose another question would now be a question regarding scope as well. Um, and that's the extent of our investigation and how, how, what are we investigating? Is there anything more that we can be looking at? Well, we've talked about this Collatz conjecture, which is also known as the 3x plus 1 problem. But what would happen, for example, if you did 5x plus 1? So every odd number, you multiplied it by 5, add 1. Or even 7 times x plus 1. Or even just any number times x plus 1. What would happen? How would that affect the, the this sequence of numbers? Um, some of you might be wondering, well, right at the beginning, you said any positive number what would happen if i put in negative numbers into this sequence how, how would my program behave if we did that um not just the program but but also would this this little exercise has been a bit interdisciplinary because we're looking at mathematics and programming a, a, a you know a discipline of computer science well really my argument has always been that all disciplines are really a a subset of mathematics and computer science quite clearly so i mean our our, our father our founding father of computer science really was was trying to solve um something that was was borderline philosophy but really a, a maths question of, of whether or not we can you know essentially solve anything mathematically in the universe any understanding and and then as a as a byproduct of that um computing was born really and and um the, the sort of Turing complete machine, but I think I think yeah, essentially, 
if if this is something that's does just lit up a spark you will have lots of questions about this inevitably so um and i suppose another question would be well how can we improve the program well it's not very obvious right now what this program is you know it's not very if you look at it from a usability point of view it's just click a green flag and and something happens it's not very clear what it is you know even even a title on the program would be more useful let's do that that's that's not going to be too much involved we could just put um i presume we can just put some text on here um maybe i can do that on the background here so um if i go to the backdrop and i just go to this text icon um that's a, that's going to be enormous text there I'm, I'm not really sure how i can reduce the size of that text I'm zoomed in, that's good news. Okay, so a program to illustrate the Colats sequence to illustrate numbers in a Colats, should be a capital C really, Colats sequence. Okay. Um, hmm. Let's just do a, a shift in there. No, can't do that. Um, that's massive text, and I'm really not sure how to um, scale that down, to be honest with you. Um, ah, there's a scaling box there. And it's in bright red, which is a shame. Can I make it black? Yes, there we go. Okay. So, that's already improved the usability a little bit. It's, it's, it's made it clear what it is. Do I need to see that list? Probably not. Let's go into the backdrop and let's go to scripts and um, hmm, data. And just untick the list there. Um, starting number is probably quite handy to see. Uh, and the maximum height. But the Y scale isn't that useful by the looks of things. Um, let's put these over here. There we go. And click the green flag. Again, it's not very usable because the user doesn't have much interaction with the program. You can't pick your own starting number. It just randomly generates it. We don't know what random starting number it is. But it's got us started on a nice illustration for the program. Starting number of one, and that's scaled to the maximum height of one. So maybe we need an exception for the number one. What's the chance of that? One in a hundred chance of getting the number one there. Got the number 94 here. Okay. Oh, look, nice, nice pattern emerging there. Um, so yeah that's just improved the usability a little bit but what other improvements could we make and i've i've named a few as well um i think what i'll do depending i mean this is the first time i've, I've done um something like this um online as a, as a stream really um video i think in future depending on how well received this video is i'll look at some other visualizations of the colax conjecture um, there's a tree form that we can look at. We can explore some things such as modular arithmetic and visualize how that works. Um, and we can do some statistical analysis if you like. We can we can look at more generalized cases of the collapse conjecture. So instead of just 3x plus 3x plus 1, we can look at other things as well. Um, we can take it in any direction we want to, really. But I suppose what I wanted to achieve is just having a bit of a mess about, having a bit of coding in, in, in Scratch, because it's quite fun, and um, just really starting to just frame and explore this um, maths conjecture that's been knocking around for almost 100 years now, probably longer, actually. I know it goes under different names, so it's, it's quite possible that um, Lothar Kolatz wasn't the first person to discover this, um, if you like, um, but just to really just have an exploration and a bit of fun. I hope this video has been useful. I hope you do some coding of your own. Um, like I said, I'll publish this code on Scratch, but don't just go and copy the code. 
really get to understand what I've done here and then try and replicate this code yourself, um, either for this collapse conjecture or for another sequence of numbers that you prefer. OK, thank you very much for your time and have fun. And I'll see you uh, if we do a video next time round. Hopefully we will.